Some Kitsap Peninsula beaches are covered with tennis to basketball size rocks or cobbles. Often, boulders are also strewn about. If there are children with you, walking the cobbles quickly becomes a crab hunt for a variety of small crabs. Now he's in there. He's very active, the male there. Most common in the Puget Sound is the hairy shore crab with its many color variations. You may also find purple shore crabs with their spotted claws or the black clawed crab, which often rears up menacingly when its rock is lifted to defend against any foe. Similarly, small porcelain crabs are distinctive with their oversized claws. Explain to your group how to tell if a crab is male or female. Maybe you can point to the, the boy. And ask why the female abdomen is so much bigger. You may find a female protecting her eggs, which reinforces this idea. Ask enthusiastic crab hunters how many males they find versus females. Lots of boy crabs. And let them know that these crabs need to stay on the beach. Again, remind folks not to turn over rocks larger than their heads and to return the rocks gently to their original positions. Explain that otherwise, creatures living on or under the rocks, such as jingles, mussels, and barnacles, will be exposed to an unfamiliar habitat and possibly to predators. On these cobble beaches, you'll likely spot several species of large crabs, living, dead, or as molts. Adult red rock crabs have a reddish outer shell and black tipped claws. These claws have the greatest crushing power of any intertidal crab in the Pacific Northwest and can even break the thick shell of moon snails. Resembling a small dungeness, the graceful crab is distinguished by its white-edged, scalloped carapace and a tiny notch just behind the inside of the outermost point on the carapace. The delectable dungeness crab is large. Its dark orange-brown carapace may be six to eight inches across. You'll find crab molts too. In fact, this is often the best way to see large crabs. Carry these with you to tell an interesting story. Explain that a crab's hard outer shell can't grow as the crab grows, so it must be replaced periodically. The crab backs out of its shell and hides while the new shell hardens. Here's a dead red rock crab, and the one neat thing to show in the difference between a dead crab and a molt is that the carapace right here is a suture, and that's where the crab comes out when it molts. It backs out of its shell this way, and you can't pick it up on a dead crab. Unlike other crab species, hermits have a soft abdomen that sticks out behind and requires special protection. Some hermit species use snail shells that are large enough for them to hide inside. Their pliable abdomen can curl snugly around the interior spiral of the shell. Other hermit crabs opt for speed and use only a small shell that can be discarded if necessary. Smaller than crabs, but no less important, are beach hoppers, pill bugs, and shrimp. Amphipods, usually called beach hoppers or sand fleas, play a crucial role in feeding fish and in breaking down the plants that wash up on the beach. Isopods, pill bugs, sow bugs, scuds, whatever you call them, are found in salt water, fresh water, and on land. The kind of shrimp we eat are usually beyond the low tide, but small shrimp can be abundant in tide pools or around the bases of rocks when the tide is out. At night, their bright eyes give them away in the beam of light. Mollusks include some of our most recognizable and economically important shoreline creatures. Lots of snails can be found on the beach. The frilled dogwinkle is a common, medium-sized snail that ranges in color from white to gray to purple to orange. You may spot its rice grain eggs or the fluted eggs of the similarly fluted invasive Japanese oyster drill. 
Moon snails leave a fascinating trail of clues on the beach. Look for a clamshell with a characteristic hole drilled near the hinge, or a plate-sized egg collar that looks like a toilet plunger. The live snails are often just under the beach surface, but if you find a small disturbed area, look for a bit of visible mantle. Poke around to see if the impressively large moon snail is beneath the sand. Periwinkle snails tell a great story about tidal zonation. The tiny, colorful, checkered periwinkle lives high in the intertidal zone. It is a marine snail, but breathes air and will drown if in the water for too long. Conversely, the similarly sized Sitka snail gets its oxygen from the water and lives lower on the beach, though the two species do overlap. Several sea slugs, or nudibranchs, live in the intertidal, though they are often hard to spot. The most common are the small, barnacle-eating dorids and the shaggy mouse. The shaggy mouse and similar species can incorporate the stinging cells of their anemone prey into the lobes of their body. Also, keep an eye out for a nudibranch's ribbon-like egg masses. Limpets live on hard surfaces and are often abundant high in the intertidal. They have a single, uncoiled, cone-shaped shell and, like other gastropods, use their rasping tongue to scrape algae off rocks. Chitons live and eat much like limpets, suctioning onto rock using their strong foot, but instead of a single shell, chitons have eight overlapping plates on their backs. Jingle shells, or rock oysters, have two shells and fasten to rocks and other hard surfaces through a hole in the bottom shell. Jingles can even form fit to a rock surface. We'll cover other bivalves later. The lucky beach walker may encounter our most impressive mollusks, the octopuses. Two species live in the Puget Sound. The small red octopus and the giant Pacific octopus are periodically found on the beach. Observe from a distance and don't harass live octopus. These are rather intelligent creatures with remarkable color changing abilities and a beak as stout as a parrot's. Surprise your group with the fact that barnacles, although they have shells like snails or limpets, are actually related to crabs and shrimp. So do you guys know what barnacles are? Look at these, these little animals in here are kind of like little shrimp. But they glue their heads down, they're stuck inside there. Think of a tiny shrimp lying on its back, kicking its feathery legs outside the door to filter feed. The most simple of all marine invertebrates is the sponge. It's little more than a bunch of independent cells working together as a water filter. You may run across purple sponges with their bright color and volcano-like osculum, or excurrent pore. Ironically, sponges can be easily confused with the most evolved marine invertebrates. Sea squirts have a nerve cord in their early life, but settle from the plankton to behave much less a clam or a sponge, pumping water in, collecting the edibles, and purging the rest. They live singly or in colonies that look like sponges but feel rubbery to the touch. When exposed to air, sea anemones fold their tentacles inward to preserve moisture and stay cool. When covered by water, the tentacles, which contain stinging cells, are open to paralyze passing prey items like plankton, small crabs, or small fish. Anemones are not fixed to the substrate and can release their foot if need arises. Aggregating anemones are the most common and highest in the intertidal. They live in crowded colonies, partly created by their ability to split in two as each side creeps in the opposite direction. Sea stars, relatives of urchins and sea cucumbers, rest among the rocks or on adjacent mudflats. Best known are the ochre stars, stout, five-armed stars in shades of purple, orange, or dark red. 
A star that is humped up like a dome is busy opening a bivalve, such as a clam or mussel. Using hydro-powered tube feet to pry the two shells apart, and an inverted stomach to feed on the soft insides. Hopefully you'll spot a fairly soft-bodied sunflower star. Point out that this species can move fast on those two feet. Also keep an eye out for two less common many-legged stars. Morning star is the king predator of the sea stars, and just the presence of a small individual is enough to send a three-foot sunflower star running. Other frequently encountered intertidal sea stars include the orange, brown, or blue-gray mottled stars with their five long arms and the giant pink star whose name says it all. The small leather star has a slippery surface and can be anything from bright orange to red and green. Some fascinating fish can be found in the intertidal. The eel-like gunnels can hide under shells, while the speedy, well-camouflaged sculpins dart to and fro in the tide pools and at the water's edge. If you encounter a layer of bright yellow, pea-sized eggs on the bottom of a rock, don't miss their father, the plain fin midshipman, a brownish fish hiding in the water and mud below, dutifully guarding his progeny. This fascinating fish species typically dwells in deeper water, but visits the shallows to lay its eggs. Many seaweed species attach to hard surfaces or wash up in the rack line. Their variety of color, shape, and texture is truly amazing. The rack line supports an enormous abundance of beach hoppers and other invertebrates that are important food for fish and break the rack down into edible detritus. Small seaweeds can be abundant on the rocks of the intertidal. Rockweed is common in the intertidal, partly because of its high tolerance of desiccation or drying out. It can be fun to squeeze and pop rockweed air pockets, but please don't overdo it. Some coralline algae form a beautiful pink crust on large boulders and bedrock these species use calcium to build a sturdy skeleton. If you find purple laver or nori during a beach walk, ask folks if they have eaten sushi lately. The thin brown blades are dried and used to wrap sushi rolls. Ubiquitous green sea lettuce also has thin blades. The numerous local species may form large blades, thin tubes, or a combination. Turkish washcloth is often attached to cobbles, either in its black tar stage or its dark and bumpy blade stage. Turkish washcloth is smaller and actually has a different life stage, which is this black tar that you may see down there against the rock, and it just looks like a, a black uh, crust on the rock. And here's the Turkish washcloth, it tends to be darker, but they have these little papillae, these little bumps all over them. Here's this much larger one, Turkish towel. And you can often find chunks of it that you can show to people and let them handle. The branches of invasive sargassum have tiny air-filled floats that hold the plant upright in the water, where it can crowd and shade out native seaweeds. On the upside, sargassum does create a forest-like habitat for invertebrates, fish, and fish eggs. Kelps are the largest of the seaweeds. The most common species on Kitsap beaches is sugar kelp. It can be eight feet long and is a great way to show the three parts of a kelp. The root-like holdfast, the stem-like stipe, and the leaf-like blade. Bull kelp is iconic in the Pacific Northwest. It is primarily subtidal, but commonly washes up on the beach. This canopy-forming alga can reach more than 75 feet in length and grow almost two feet in a day. The air-filled bulb at the end of the long stipe keeps the photosynthesizing blades near the surface. 